Because when we are talking about issues of maternal and infant health, these are critical issues. These are life-changing issues. And this is serious business that we're about today. So we're going to go ahead and get into our discussion. Mayor, I'm going to start with you. Um, this was your brainchild to have this uh, event. Uh, this is the fifth year. Tell us, um, when you look back, uh, let's just look back to last year, what are some of the changes uh, and progress that you think has been made since we held this summit last year? Well, I think we've been able to make uh, tremendous progress. And then when I look back over the five years, in fact, um, I just see the topic is top of mind for a lot of people, not and not just women. Um, they're top of mind for policymakers. They're top of mind for community members, for executives in, in our healthcare system. Uh, so that we have raised the level of conversation. We have been, I think, able to add voice to the national conversation uh, when our lawmakers are considering bills. Uh, and, and that has been very important. We've also been able to create more partnerships um, and forge partnership, for example, with the, with the March of Dimes, but also forge more partnerships with our local provider community, uh, which has been centered in our conversations about what women need and what families need and how we can get them uh, into our services. Now, one thing that troubles me about programs, great programs that we craft and we come up with and we think a lot about, and then people don't participate in them. And so we're always trying to make sure that we're connecting people and making it easier for people to participate. And that's why the Strong Family, Strong Futures was such an important advance for us. Um, because in the discussion of what people need, giving cash payments has been controversial at times. Um, but we have been able to target uh, our investments where we believe they're going to have the biggest impact on um, the first year of young people's lives. And what's more important than that? So um, when I look back on last year, we, we knew that we would have these partnerships in place, but we've actually had experience with it, uh, which gave me a lot of confidence to say, I can use some of these very important American rescue dollars to do something similar for TANF families uh, who were getting their kids ready for school. That's wonderful, thank you. Let's applaud that. That is a lot of progress. And Mayor, I, I, I'm excited that you talked about partnerships um, because we really have an example of partnerships right here on the stage with us today. Uh, it is so vitally important when we have both local and federal leaders working together. Uh, so I'm going to turn to one of our members of Congress, um, um, whom we're so ha happy to have with us here today. I'm going to start with you, uh, Congresswoman Underwood. Uh, what is the Black Maternal Health Caucus? focused on in the last few months of the 117th Congress. I know that is an effort that is near and dear to your heart. It's very much a focus of your work. So tell us a little bit about what the caucus is, is doing. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here in the District of Columbia. It has been a real honor to be able to work with uh, Mayor Bowser it, with the Black Maternal Health Caucus, which is one of the largest bipartisan caucuses in the United States Congress, exclusively focused on ending our nation's maternal health crisis. Uh, I share Mayor Bowser's point of view that in 2022, we should not have moms dying as a result of childbirth in this country. We know what to do in order to save moms' lives, and we need to be courageous enough to make the policy choices, to make those policy changes and investments to save lives. So um, I introduced a large bill. It's called the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. Uh, there's a legislative word called an omnibus, and it's for moms. So that's where the name came from. It's 12 bills to address every clinical and non-clinical uh, factor that's contributing to maternal mortality in this country. One of our bills, uh, the Protecting Moms Who Served Act to help our veteran moms, uh, was signed into law by President Biden in November 2021. Another has passed the House already with unanimous bipartisan support. Uh, it's called the Maternal Vaccination Act. And then 80% of the rest was in a big bill called the Build Back Better Act at the end of 2021. We are on a mission to find a legislative vehicle to get the rest of the Momnibus signed into law by the end of this calendar year. But to do it, 
we will need your help. Congresswoman Brown and I are focused. We're doing the work. We're talking to our colleagues. Uh, we have great Senate partners. Uh, Senator Cory Booker is our lead sponsor in the Senate, but there's some bipartisan aspects of it over there. And so listen, I know the district, you know, we're working on your representation. Okay, we have not forgotten Thank uh, you. that we need to get this done. But in the meantime, y'all are here, your voices matter, and they resonate in the halls of Capitol Hill. So I would invite you to join us in the advocacy to get the Momnibus signed into law by the end of 2022. Thank you. Thank you. And Congresswoman Underwood, you just stole one of my questions because I was going to ask you now, what does, what does everyone else need to do? But you just gave everyone my Action orders. items, let's go. You, you all have them, right? You're taking notes. Um, Congresswoman Brown, uh, I, I want to talk about data. Uh, we all know that numbers and data are vitally important, uh, particularly for those of you who are lawmakers. In your home state of Ohio, uh, the mortality rate for black infants is unfortunately three times as high as the mortality rate for white infants. Further, we know that black women are three to four times more likely to die from childbirth and pregnancy-related causes than white women. And everyone needs to know that that is regardless of class, educational background. It's a race issue. And Mayor, we're gonna have a real conversation today, right? Because right. we know that racial justice issues play a role in pretty much everything that we have to focus on and all the systems that we have to deal with. So given that, Congresswoman Brown, what, does, what steps does the federal government need to take in order to remove discrimination and bias from maternal health care as we are facing it right now? Well, thank you for that question. And I also want to associate myself with the mayor's comments and my colleagues' comments. And thank you, Mayor, for putting this um, together. It is such a tremendous honor and uh, pleasure to be here. Um, for the people that don't know me, my career on politics started in local government. And prior to coming to Congress, I led the initiative to declare racism a public health crisis. Um, that work was started because of the disparities in our infant and maternal mortality, specifically in Cleveland, where we have world-class hospitals ranked number one in the world for so many things, but we had third world infant mortality rates. And to your point, it did not make sense to me because this was not an economic issue, it was not a social class issue, but what we learned in the research is that there was systemic, institutional, and structural racism that created toxic stress in women that has been passed down since slavery. Um, one of the analogies that I have picked up from my YouTube university um, <laughs> was a young lady who spoke so uh, powerfully about racism and how it has impacted our society. And she used the mo um, Monopoly game as an analogy. And she spoke about if you were playing a game of Monopoly and you were told that you did not have the opportunity to play for 400 rounds. And for each of those turns, you had to work for someone else. How would that impact your life? Then after that, you were given the opportunity to play. So now you have to play catch up, but you don't have anything to catch up with. So, but despite that, you're able to do it over the next 50 rounds, you start to make advances. Then someone comes and burns your game like they did in Rosewood in Tulsa. That is the story of black America. So now we're again starting from scratch. And then you are told again, you still have an opportunity to play and catch up, but you can't. And the only way to level the playing field is if I give you some of what I have earned over those or what I've acquired over those rounds that we were playing. So now there becomes this mental anxiety because I'm telling you, you don't have what you have because you earned it. You have what you have because I gave it to you. It creates a toxic stress that is passed down from generations, from generations through slavery that has created this um, debilitating effect for women to be able to carry their babies to full term. So how do we deal with that? 
Well, we deal with it by things that you have already talk, uh, talked about, putting financial resources into hands, creating programs around equity and criminal justice and education and transportation, where all of these um, things that have had an impact on our society have created such disparities in the African-American community. So it's not just about financial resources. It is about clean drinking water, removing redlining so that we have quality homes, um, making sure that we have green space so that we can live an enjoyable life in our community. These are the things that we have to be very conscious and aware of and make the investments and provide the tools so that women that look like me and the ladies on this panel can have a better quality of life and be able to carry their babies to full term. So declaring racism as a public health crisis was not just words on paper. For me, it was about making measurable, tangible, results. So starting at a place where we include statistical data about the disparities and seeing where we can go from there. Thank you, Congresswoman. <laughs> and I want to under underscore something about your comments, which is that it's important that we know that it, you have to connect the dots. None of these issues are issues that we deal with in silos, correct? Uh, you just discussed, Congresswoman, uh, that this is related to clean water, it's related to our schools, it's related to clean and, and adequate housing. And I will tell you just this morning on National Public Radio, for those of you who, like me, are NPR junkies, mm -hmm. they had a story that talked about the connection between the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and how that had a disparate impact on black and brown and low-income communities, and changes to our voting and redistricting laws in the country. And you know, you all, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I've worked on many issues over the course of my career. I did not realize that connection myself. So it is so important what Congresswoman Brown just pointed out. We have to connect the dots on so many of these issues. And an important part of connecting the dots is having medical expertise like we have on the stage with us today. And uh, Dr. Anukoga, I'm so proud to have you with us today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let me ask you this. We all have been living through and are continuing to live through a pandemic. The COVID crisis brought to bear so many of the disparities that people in black and brown communities always knew existed. But for some reason, the rest of the country and perhaps the rest of the world did not know these disparities existed. Can you talk to us a little bit um, as a researcher uh, about how COVID-19 has affected um, our communities and changing health outcomes specifically for expectant mothers? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. And I'm so pleased. It's such an honor to be here. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic, like you said, has exacerbated things that we already knew through our lived experiences as, as Black and American. Um, racism is the underpinning of all of this. And we saw it from the beginning of the pandemic, even how things were rolled out. Information was translated, what languages, who got the vaccines, how often the clinics were staffed. And so the pandemic just exacerbated what we already knew. How did this play out in pregnancy and maternal health? So during the pandemic, at the height of it, black and brown birthing people who tested positive had their babies physically removed from the room, right, for the safety of the baby. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of the social support that is so critical in pregnancy, particularly for our communities, was stripped away. I mean, the group prenatal care, the centering pregnancy model, which you're getting women together, going through the process based on your gestational age, having your birthing people in the room with you. I had a child, my first son was April 2019, right before the pandemic. My second son was October 2020 towards later pandemic, even though we're still in a pandemic. And my husband, my partner, was able to come to all prenatal visits. That's incredibly important. People that delivered in the middle 2020, 2021, they didn't have that. So your person is not able to be in a room. They were restricting doulas, right? We saw that things were happening in different hospitals. In Massachusetts, where I bring you greetings from, we created the Massachusetts COVID-19 Maternal Equity Coalition because we were hearing stories from black and brown birthing people saying, this is not happening in this other hospital. They're able to have support people. I'm not able to have support people, lactation consultants, doulas in the postpartum space, 
all of these resources that are critical to combating what we know are maternal health inequities were really reduced and frankly eliminated, particularly in communities of color. So that's how the pandemic really, really had a bad impact on us. We also saw an increase in maternal death during the pandemic. The rates increased. The latest data that we have available from 2020 shows a sharp increase in black communities. That is problematic. That was highlighted by the pandemic. You know, thank you so much for, for underscoring that. And, and, and I have a question for you. Um, do you think that we're seeing a surge in responsiveness from communities and from leaders like, like Mayor Bowser? Clearly, we're seeing responsiveness here, but what are we seeing around the rest of the country? Are we seeing real ch tangible changes? Yeah, I think we're seeing it in waves and pockets. And until we start making those connections and frankly, stop working in silos, sharing resources, sharing ideas, sharing funding, funding people that are doing the work, we're not going to move this needle. I'm about to drop my microphone, but I won't. I won't. Thank you. And congratulations on your work at Tufts. Thank you so much. And Mayor, I want to come back to you because one of the things that you have focused on is the importance of connecting the dots with respect to your entire administration. You know, we've been very focused on making sure that our government is open, um, that those, those years, almost two years where services weren't always in person, weren't as intensive as they were before the pandemic, are getting back on track. But we also learned in the pandemic that some things um, happening virtually were better. Uh, we did see people, depending on what the service was, being better able to keep appointments um, and to see their, their physicians or providers um, without the, the hurdle of transportation. So there are things that we learned in the pandemic um, that, that worked um, that we want to double down on, especially in the telehealth space. Uh, and so we're going to continue to do that. When we talk about these issues, um, it's not only important to talk about how the educational community and access has been impacted, but also how important it is to educate the community about these issues. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation that we're very proud of is we have a leadership institute. And it's one of the hallmarks of the foundation where we ensure that interns and fellows have opportunities to learn about policy in Washington. And our fellows in particular do research on these critical issues and we have fellows. In fact, I have two of them in the room. They're somewhere here and we, we love them. They do wonderful work and they are experts. They are both doctors and they are doing work on these very issues. Um, and Congresswoman Bush, uh, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Underwood, I'm sorry, is a proud, proud example. She is a former uh, intern with the, with the Leadership Institute at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. So we are obviously so very proud of her um, and her accomplishments. Um, but I, I want to come back to you, Congresswoman Underwood. You are also a registered nurse. So as a registered nurse and as someone who represents the great state of Illinois, can you talk to us about what the federal government can learn from nurses and states across the country to help address this issue? And we heard the mayor say her mother is a nurse. What can you all teach us and what should we be focusing on? Yes, I am a very proud registered nurse. I'm a public health nurse and I use my nursing skills every day. Thank you every day in this job. One of the things that we learned very early on in nursing school is to do an assessment first. And believe it or not, that is so rare on Capitol Hill. So many of my colleagues have their favorite solution that they skip over the part of learning about the problem. And when they embrace that favorite solution, it doesn't matter what the data says. It doesn't matter if it will actually work. They're all in. I have a different approach. I have a data-driven, evidence-based approach to legislating and problem solving, but we have to do that full assessment. And so earlier in the conversation, we mentioned the data, right? Black women are three to four times more likely to die. For every death, there are 70, seven zero near misses. That is unacceptable. So we have this dual crisis in this country of maternal mortality and severe morbidity. And because we understand the nature of the problem after doing that assessment, then we can embrace evidence-based solutions to save lives. This is not theoretical. <laughs> this is not hypothetical. This will work. We know how much it's going to cost. 
$3 billion over 10 years, and we end the disparity in this country, the United States no longer leads the industrialized world in maternal deaths. And guess what? It's not just helping black moms. It helps all of our moms. And so I think... Thank you. I think we need more nurses in Congress, obviously. <laughs> our colleague, Cori Bush, couldn't make it. She's one of our other nurses. And we have one more, the great chairwoman, Eddie Bernice Johnson. We are a trio of black women. We are nurses. We are proud, and we're doing the work. But there, we need to be in these spaces. Um, we need to be in every state legislature. We need to be running major cities. We need to be in the governor's mansions. We need to be in these places embracing these data-driven solutions. You didn't ask me about this, but I would be remiss if I did not mention the vaccine. The doctor talked about um, what happened during COVID and why we saw so many black moms dying. Part of the problem is that for so long, the docs and, and you know, the advisors did not recommend that pregnant people take the vaccine. They were not included in the vaccine trials. It is essential. We just had a new version of the vaccine roll out. It works. We need to be getting our expectant moms, our postpartum moms, we need to be getting vaccinated. We don't have to continue to die as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. And any conversation that we have about saving moms' lives in this environment, we can't skip over that. So I'm sorry to make that little public health interjection, but you know we have to do it. Absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman Underwood. And you see, I don't stick to scripts, so that's fine. This is a conversation, okay? We're, we're having a real honest conversation about what needs to be said. Now, Congresswoman Brown, talk to us about the kinds of tools that people should be employing right in their own backyards. Thank you for that. So it's, to me, you know, things are, might sound incredibly simple, but the golden rule, first and foremost, treat people like you want to be treated. Um, I mean, when we go into the hospitals and as black women, um, there is no uh, mistaking that our um, tolerance for pain is uh, this deemed higher than most. And so we have to remove some of these implicit biases um, from our um, doctors and nurses and people who are um, giving us medical health care, because that is a big issue. There's an organization um, in Cleveland, Risk LD, that really works hard to remove the implicit bias by focusing on um, what Congresswoman Underwood talked about, the data, the real data, looking at your vital statistics and not just going off of um, what you or the doctor may be perceiving as a tolerant level of pain, um, implementing those things. But for the everyday folks who are um, looking for something to do, being more uh, aware about these issues and being able to have uncomfortable conversations. Um, I say this often, as a black woman, I'm comfortable being in uncomfortable spaces. It happens to us um, frequently. I was just in a room yesterday um, with the Ohio's Farmers Bureau. I was the only woman in the room that was black. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But I'm comfortable in that space. And so we have to be comfortable having some of these uncomfortable conversations. And if you're uncomfortable, then you should be asking yourself why. Why am I uncomfortable talking about these difficult issues? Because we have to get rid of these barriers, these statistics, these stereotypes, um, these things that are causing the implicit bias that are um, costing people that look like me their lives. And that's what we have to think about, the factor of how important it is, because you are risking people's lives. How important is it to take care of your neighbor? How important is it to make sure that we are um, promoting healthy lifestyles and making sure that people are getting what they need both mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The thing that I most appreciate about this conversation is it is a holistic approach. It's the medical, it's the policy, it's the leadership, it is um, the education. It is bringing all these components together to make sure that we are working holistically to find solutions. We've been working in silos too long. We have to stop doing that. It is not helpful to work in silos. We have to share the information and we have to get to know each other better. And we have to also extend each other some grace. One of the things that when we start to talk about racism, um, our Caucasian counterparts often get defensive, right? But if we were to diagnose someone with cancer, you don't get mad at the doctor. 
for diagnosing you with cancer, you try to figure out what it is we can do to eradicate the cancer. We do everything that we can to figure out how we can get rid of that cancer. Well, we need to be approaching these issues with that same vigor and vigilance to make sure how we get rid of the systemic, institutional, and structural racist barriers that have made this a conversation for too long. Putting things into action, creating measurable metrics around education, around access to affordable housing, around investing in transportation, around criminal justice reform, around investing in mental health. These are the things that we need to be doing collectively and collaboratively to make sure that we are no longer having conversations about this and moving on to issues. Because the thing that is most disturbing, and I think all of my panelists was, would agree, more than half of the deaths are preventable. We, we, Lauren, our Congresswoman Underwood said it, we know what to do, we just have to start doing it. Thank you, thank you. Those are marching orders for all of us. Those are marching orders. Um, Dr. Anu Koga, uh, I'd like to ask you this. Uh, when we talk about economics, and we've talked, a lot of people are focused on what happens after the fact. We know about so many of the issues and how economics impacts m mothers and, and maternal health issues once children are born. But talk to us about the role economics plays as we are leading up to um, giving birth and, and people expanding their families. That's something that people aren't really focused on. Help us to understand that connection too as we are talking about um, the inextricable links between all of these issues. Great, thank you so much. So oftentimes when I'm asked to speak about things like this, and I just want to um, clarify, I have a PhD in maternal child health. I'm not an OBGYN. Shout out to my OBs and MFMs. They're great colleagues, but I am in the public health space through and through. Uh, you know, one of the things that led me to actually get a PhD in, in maternal child health and focus on research was thinking about inequities. I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, um, the capital of the state, very underserved community. That's actually a maternity care desert now. Um, and the hospital I was born in, my siblings were born in, no longer have OB units. And so you remove this economic base from a major city. Um, Trenton actually never recovered from the riots of the 60s. Um, it's still very heavily underinvested in. And then you wonder why people have adverse birth outcomes. If, if a community does not have economic stability, the opportunities are going to be decreased. The, the likelihood of upward mobility is going to be harder. And I see friends that I grew up with and, and they're struggling and they're having complications in their pregnancy. One of my girlfriends, she had a placental abruption, a very high risk complication of pregnancy. And there's no place in the city of Trenton she can go get the level of care that she needs. So she had to take an ambulance, which she doesn't have the money to pay for, to a hospital in a more affluent part of the state to get the care that she needed. This conversation about economics is critical. And also workforce development. It burns my grits when I see these... <laughs> I know I'm from Jersey, but I like that term. You know, it burns my grits when I see these, <laughs> when I see these, um, you know, requirements for jobs. You have to have five years of post-baccalaureate. You have to have a college degree. No, you don't. That does not speak to your expertise and capacity. What you're doing is leaving out a large portion of the workforce who cannot get those types of jobs. So... You know, for me, I think we need to revamp the system. I'm actually in my Center for Black Maternal Health. We are creating, we're working with the local community college in Boston to create a certificate program. We're going to take community health workers, we're going to take doulas, we're going to take midwives and train them in this maternal health and equity space. And then they're going to be able to get higher paying jobs because they have the certificate. We're going to be launching that next year. That just, you know, God gives you these ideas. We had a relationship with the local community college. And this is going to be part of the workforce. The workforce is going to look different. I love Mayor Bowser. She was up here recruiting for nurses. Anybody want to be a nurse? You better come talk to her. Because she was talking about recruiting for nurses. Our workforce does not look like the way it needs to look. Right? We need to train people. I'm talking middle school, high school, put them in spaces where these things feel attainable. When I give talks, particularly back home in Trenton, you know, people are like, oh, you know, did you grow up here? Yes, girl. I used to sit in that desk right there. My name is carved under the, you know, like people, because, because people like me don't make it out to get a high school, bachelor's, master's, PhD. I'm legit a unicorn and still have some swag, I would think. You feel me? Like I'm not so far gone that I don't have swag. 
that, that is hard to come by, but we have to make those models of success more attainable for our communities. That is the key. Ma'am, I'm sorry, Mayor. <laughs> Uh, we need more corporate leadership because these companies have the data and oftentimes these companies have the data before they are reported to federal sources. We are trying to clean up the federal reporting from every state, but guess what? Yesterday in the news, y'all can look it up in the Houston Chronicle, we got crazy mayors like Greg Abbott trying to suppress the information about maternal death till what? After the election. Right, they're doing stuff like restricting people's reproductive rights and moms are dying as a result of childbirth. But guess what, the companies have the information. And if we have the information, going back to my assessment point, right, we can better solve these problems. And so I would invite these corporate um, stakeholders, people who are active in this space, you know, we got a lot of apps on our phone. We got a lot, we are sharing our data with a lot of companies and they know when we are having emergencies, they know when we're having adverse pregnancy outcomes, we know, they know when there's complications, right? All of those players need to take some ownership and, and joining us to save mom's lives. Um, and all of you, I would welcome you to join us to the Black Maternal Health Caucus. You can find us on Twitter at BMH Caucus. Uh, together, we're gonna get the Momnibus signed into law. We're gonna get some money into these communities. And before I go, I just have to say, there's a lot of conversation about the District of Columbia and the disparities in this community, but there are some bright spots Absolutely. of innovation and clinical excellence happening here in the district that is a shining role model for communities across the country under the leadership of your mayor. And so I just wanna acknowledge the great progress that has been made and the work that has been done. And what we are trying to do is give y'all the resources to take it nationwide. Yes. I am very proud. One of the bright spots we have here is a locally funded paid family leave program um, that provides tremendous benefits. Uh, and you will hear me say often, while I'm proud of our program, I don't think DC residents and businesses should be the only ones paying for it. So you ask what's missing. We need a national paid family leave law. You're here. Sorry. Um, because we need people to be able to take the time that they need um, before birth, um, for birth, after birth without worrying about how they're going to pay the rent. So uh, that would be, I think, one big thing that we can do nationally uh, that would really change the environment for people giving birth. Thank you, Mayor. You all heard it. I know you all took copious notes, okay? We are expecting that folks will leave this summit and be change makers. That's what we're expecting. And not just for the folks in this room, we are expecting you all to go out and tell another one and another one and another one. That's how we build collaboration. That's how we build change. And I see somebody putting her hand up. I hope that means yes, like, like you do at church, like yes. yes, that's what we're gonna do. So with that, um, I'm going to thank our amazing panelists. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you, thank you for kickstarting today's summit. And I hope that the rest of the summit is at equally amazing. And everyone, as my former uh, mentor, the late great Congressman John Lewis always says, go out and get into good trouble. So I leave you with that. Take care. Hello, everyone. Please be aware that we have additional seating to accommodate everyone who needs a seat. Please, we invite you at this time to please move to Ballroom B to continue viewing the Maternal and Infant Health Summit.